Tibbers. Um, she's an actor. She's <coughs> the Dominic Kittenson of values, which is now in its fourth year. Fourth year. Fifth year. So, fifth year. Fifth year. Those of you that were here last year may have um, heard some of this before. This is the um, kitten data survey, which we've been doing now for four, we've got four years' worth of data, so this year will be our fifth year. Um, now, the purpose of it is actually to monitor the health of the breed. Um, obviously, we're all concerned about inbreeding and that kind of thing, and reduced litters, reduced sizes of Burmese, do we need to outcross, etc., etc. Well, we can't actually find out where we're going unless we know where we're starting from. So the idea was we would actually collect data from amongst Burmese breeders to actually see what the starting point was. Um, I'll just click to the next slide. Right, so there's some very, very simple facts that we can actually collect from our own breeders. And um, I did some research onto some previous uh, research that was done in America by Dr. Susan Little. Um, she did a very similar thing with breeders in the USA. And they, they just sent in some very simple statistics from the litters that they've bred. Um, what we're looking at is average birth weights, average litter sizes, number of C-sections, number of stillbirths, the number of kittens with FCK, and uh, kitten mortality rates. We're not looking at what individual breeders are doing, so anonymous data is absolutely fine. What we're looking at is the overall percentages so that we've got a starting point. We can see, are we going up? Are we going down? Are we remaining steady? So, um, and also where we've got imported genes and we've got outcrosses, we'll see, is it gonna start to make a difference in, in the sort of statistics that we've got? If we start to see a downward trend in some important levels like litter sizes or an upwards in C-sections or an, uh, a dramatic change in the number of stillbirths, we can start to have a look and perhaps consult with our veterinary advisors as to whether we need to take some action. First year we had 23 litters in the survey, 18, 18, last year sadly only 15. The more data that we get, the more reliable the statistics are going to be. Because where, where you've got a, a small amount of data, it only needs a couple of anomalies, like a, a litter of 12, that it, it sways the overall statistics. So the more data that comes in, the more it will, it will even out the, the sort of highs and troughs. So more data, the better, please. The number of kittens in the survey, 305 so far. So it's a total of 74 litters in all so far and 305 kittens in total. Um, now, I'm comparing what we've got so far with... This was Dr Susan Little's study, which was done online with breeders in the USA in 2003-2004. Now, of course, with it being the USA, there was contemporary, traditional and European Burmese, so you can expect some slight differences. Um, but she had 67 breeders reported on 206 litters consisting of 927 individual kittens. Um, it's quite interesting, but some of her results are actually broadly very similar with the ones we've got so far, so we're obviously along the right lines. Um, the average litter size in her survey was 4.5. Um, her stillbirth rate reported was 12% in the contemporary, which I think is the USA Burmese, and 7% in the, the other two types. C-section rate was 11% in European Burmese, less than 1% in the traditional and the contemporary Burmese, which surprised me. Um, average birth weights are almost identical to the ones we're reporting, 86 grams for males and 81 grams for females. The flat-chested kitten rate averaged around 3%. 48% of flat-chested kittens didn't survive until they were four weeks old. So obviously they're, they're quite badly affected. Um, so now these are the average birth weights. So I did laugh actually. I had to have a C-section a few years ago on my girl Lily. And the vet came out shaking his head saying, I don't hold up a lot of hope because there's only three and they're only 100 grams each. <laughs> and I thought... That actually sounds quite a lot to me. <laughs> and he did admit he'd only ever done C-section on a Maine Coon before, so he didn't, 
he didn't know how big the kittens were meant to be. And that got me thinking. And I phoned round a few people. And I said, how big is the average kitten? And everyone went, oh, I don't really know. So I thought, well, let's actually find out. Um, so we've got fairly consistent figures. So it varies from 89 for a couple of years for males, um, 85 to 87 for females, a low one of 80 there. But overall, over the last four years, males average 87.6 and females average 84.4. So why this is useful is if we start to see over the next two or three years a downward trend, we know we've got a problem. We don't, we don't seem to be seeing it. They're all broadly similar. I don't think two or three grams either way is much difference. I think it very much depends what time you weigh them, whether they've had a first suckle or not, or whether they've done a first poo, because that can be two grams and make all the difference. So don't worry too much about a gram here or there. But um, as I say, Dr. Susan's little was 86 grams for males and 81 grams for females. So we're all about the same ballpark so I think I think we're we're getting some good data average litter size there does seem to have been it seems quite variable this year or last year's figures rather average has worked out at 3.64 4.34 3.84 and the year before that 5.08 it may be because the reduced number of litters information that was submitted it may be just a statistical anomaly so I think it's very important that we carry this on and we see what we get next year because we start to see a very definite downward trend over say three or four years of litter size then I think that's something perhaps we might want to start looking at so I think the more information we get next year it will give us a more a more accurate figure as I say more data means a more accurate um, statistic at the end of it um, no. That that is something. If we start to identify at some point there's a problem, and and we as a committee we, we decide we speak to our genetic and veterinary advisors, that's probably something they'll start to look at then. I don't know. I really don't know. That's quite an interesting point. I'm not sure there's ever been any any research done into that. Mm. Yeah, there's an anomaly here, but what I've found over the years is that often the cream reducing number of, uh, say, one, two litres, mm. but then suddenly it's almost as if a, a, a sudden rush before she's finished, she'll have double the number of kittens and then she'll stop them together. Mm. So, mm. you know, I mean, if you give that into it, then it distorts everything again. Yeah. I think there's a danger of making this too complicated at the moment. We want to stick with those five basic facts, um, which are statistics that are, you know, you've either got five kittens or you've got four kittens, you, you can't. So we, so we want it straightforward. But that is something, certainly, if we start to identify a problem, that's probably one of the aspects we, we would want to look at. Because a lot of readers are getting older themselves. Copy the problem. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, now, something lots of us like to know is what's the best time of year to have kittens? Obviously not when you're just about to go on holiday. Average litter size, live births by month. Through, I, I've combined all four year statistics in there and June is by far the best time if you want lots of kittens. <laughs> and it's quite clear, it's been all the way through, it's definitely better if you want lots of kittens June is best time, but you have to remember you will get a commensurately smaller average weight for the kitten, but it's not that much smaller, it's not, it's not below average, so if you really want a lot of kittens, that's quite clearly the best time. Why it's lower in July and April, I have absolutely no idea. It may just be a statistical blip, so that, that may not be anything to um, worry about. December is quite a bit smaller, um, which, to be honest, it, it kind of sounds natural that um, an animal would have its big healthy litters in spring and early summer, 
Um, so whether that's just a natural thing, I don't know. Um, because all that. Well, no, because these are averages. So it wouldn't. These aren't the number of litters. Yeah. Yeah. There's definite drop. You see a drop for the the number of litters born. You see a drop in August when everyone's on holiday, and there's obviously a drop at Christmas as well. So you do, you do get anomalies there. Yeah, could, it, could, it, could it be that, because I found that I'm getting the, the same people ascending me forms, and could it be that the same people who have small litters yes. actually have their Queen's kidney in December? Yes. Yeah, that's why the so more data we've, we've got, more, more data more from more different, from different, different people, yeah. Because otherwise we're, we're kind of... You, you'll get somebody who consistently has three kittens um, and that will sway the statistics. So we need other people who regularly have four or five kittens with that particular queen and it will even it out and it'll end up being 4.5. Sorry, um, Carolyn. Can you remember we did this last year? Can you remember when the last year, June... Was the same? June, yes. Yes, all four years, June is markedly um, the best time if you want big litters. Yes, so. Um, just to give you a phone, I might have walked it. How many cats have we got in the um, 74 litters, 305 kittens <laughs> so far. Right. Um, so yes, but we don't know if they're different cats. Yes, we don't know how many queens that involves. Because it's anomalous data. Yeah, yeah. Birth weights. Uh, remember you saying that June had the biggest um, number of kittens per litter. The average birth weight was 83 grams. So it's probably, if you take male and females together, that's going to be about average birth weight. So it does, it's quite clear that June is the time if you want to look. Um, there are considerable ups and downs. Um, But overall, March has the highest kitten weight, and that's been the same over the last four years, which is and quite it's interesting. Like numbers as well, isn't it? Hundred, yeah. Yeah, so kind of looking at the weight, it's not just the number of kittens, but the weight of the kittens. It seems like it's a good healthy time. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, having only done it for four years, I'm not sure we can actually start drawing any conclusions like that. But it's quite an interesting thing to sort of start following over the next few years. So, um, as you say, the birth weight in December was nothing because we were all having Christmas. So, now this is quite interesting. It's very variable um, each year. Now, that may be the data that's being sent in. It may be that the FCK is being caused by something else external. Um, but we've gone from 5.5 for the first year, 2013, up to 6.84, down to 5.57, and last year, only 2%. But that makes it overall, over the last four years, 4.97. And the one in the USA was 3% overall. So something, you know, worth monitoring over the next few years to see what the actual statistics work out as. But as I say, we're not necessarily... There's no point in picking a single year statistics or a single litter statistics. It's just something to monitor the ups and downs. Um, percentage of stillborn kittens. Um, the overall... I haven't put it on there, I'm afraid. The overall rate with our data is around 15%. Um, now, it's gone from 9.6 the first year, right up to 21% that year, the second year, 12%, 16.7. It is something, it just seems so variable. What, what the reason is for that, I just don't know. <laughs> Um, Steph and I, um, we had a chat about the seal line, and we said, well, what are we getting with these um, statistics of stillborn kittens? Is it because they are actually stillborn kittens, mm. or are those kittens that die shortly after? Mm. 
And is the variation because the breeder had, didn't get there in time to see the kitten born, so they all lived in their sack? Are they shooting those in the sacks? So we've got all those sort of things to contend with. This is why it's so important, and Steph agrees with me on this, that if we get, the more data we get, these things become relatively unimportant. Not, not completely, I don't think that's true, but. Um, it, it lessens the impact. It doesn't yeah, you, you don't get the big peaks so, and so troughs. We do need fresh blood coming in, you know, to give us your statistics and everything, please. And the other thing I would just caution is um, some of the FCK kittens may actually be stillborn, so they wouldn't necessarily be reported as FCK if they were stillborn. Obviously, you don't want to. About them. So th there are always things like that to bear in mind with all these statistics. So you might find the FCK right is artificially low or the stillbirth rate is artificially high because of those. But we have to assume that those same errors are the same each year. So you've you just got to kind of always bear that in mind when you look at statistics like this. Um, C-section rate is very, very similar overall to Dr Little's one in the USA. In fact, ours is slightly lower. But again, it's completely random at the moment. It's gone from none at all in year one of all the litters. That, and that was the biggest number of litters that were reported in the first year. I think it was 23 litters. There wasn't a single C-section. Um, gone up to 16.7% the following two years. And this year it's down to 7.1%, which is quite good overall. But again, more data coming in and we can start to look at everything long term and uh, see where we're going. And if we start to see drastic... For instance, if, we, if there was some vigouring introduced and I'm thinking if the kittens started to become particularly big and the girls couldn't cope with them we might then see an increase in c-sections so although we've increased the the vigor of the kittens it's not necessarily a good thing if it's going to mean that the mothers can't cope with them so it's it sort of swings and roundabouts all the time so can I just ask a couple of records of sizes of this yes yeah, Going back about 20 years, mm. all the way through analysis, um, but then we converted. Do, do you want? Do you want this data? It would take some doing, but I could put it all together. I'm, I'm sorry, as you know, I'm in the middle of moving house. But once, once, if you can hang on to it, once I can get settled and get, I'm sure we could put it all on a spreadsheet and see. See what we get from that. You can convert it to, to yeah, to grams. Yeah. yeah. The only problem is the differential between ounces and grams is, is quite a lot. It's quite high. But no. Oh yeah, I suppose you could. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to do. We'll, we'll just keep reminding me. We will do that at some point. So um, I wonder whether a lot of the C-sections could be down to um, the one bed on that day. Yes. Yeah. Um, it may be down to, there's one thing perhaps for us to consider, it may be down to inexperienced breeders who perhaps can't get hold of their mentor, don't know whether to wait or rush to the vets. Um, I think all of us, if we were in any doubt, we'd probably rush to the vets. And once you've got a girl in at the vets and she's about to kit, and they would nearly always go for C-section, just to be on the safe side. So um, it's, it's something definitely worth, worth monitoring. Um, now, this is how people can contribute. What we need from our breeders. Um, we need the weight of the kittens in grams, please. As I said, the differential with ounces is too much. So grams would be... And just an ordinary set of kitchen scales, just pop them on there. Um, any that are obviously got FCK, um, any, uh, the number of that are stillborn, any with really bad faults, um, you know, something, not, not little tiny, tiny tail faults, um, but any with very, very serious faults, note those on a separate sheet. Um, and just the litter size and whether a C-section was needed. Completely anonymous, we don't need to know who's who, because that's, that's not of any consideration. And there's another form to do at 12 weeks old, 
Um, number of surviving kittens, which we hope will be 100%. Obviously, if any have got FCK, they may have passed away. They may not. Have, they may survive the birth and passed away later. Um, and any that have got Another thing to note is, is where you've got um, problems with a breed, you'll get kittens surviving to four or five, six weeks old and then fading. So we've never seen any of that, thank goodness. So I haven't actually put the graphs together for the 12-week waits because, to be honest, there isn't very much to show of any great interest. When I actually get time, I'll put them all together and then we can look at the average weight of a kitten at 12 weeks old. But there, were, there wasn't anything remarkable to look at. Um, hardly any of the kittens um, died before 12 weeks old. Um, I think there was only one, and that was an accident. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think there was anything very interesting to report on that. Um, so anonymous data is fine. Um, we don't need breeder's name or prefix because it's irrelevant. And if you want advice on genetics and breeding, don't ask me. Ask somebody who knows a bit more than me about it. Mm -hmm. Um, all the information can be sent to Mrs Dell. Um, Joyce actually compiles it all onto an Excel spreadsheet. So I just get a list of numbers and I've got it all set up on the Excel jobby so that I just plug the numbers in and it creates the graphs every year. And then I take each year's figures and I put them on to the average one so we get a running total. Um, I think if people are reluctant to divulge information, that will sway the statistics quite badly. I know people don't like to talk about when they've had a poor litter, nobody does, but say you've had three kittens and none of them have survived, just put it all on a bit of paper and post it to Joyce. We don't want any names and addresses, we don't care who it is. Um, but it is very important information because if people just report the six fat healthy kittens that they've had with no c-section and no veterinary intervention we're going to get a very very false view of what's going on so we need we need everything i mean we are getting an awful lot of big healthy litters but it is quite upsetting, I know, I've had it happen to me, that you don't necessarily want to talk about it, but if you can just hang on to the information, put it on a bit of paper and either email it or, or if you want to be anonymous, post it to Joyce, and then we can add it onto the, the statistics. Is there anybody here who, who's got any reason why they wouldn't want to fill in? Is there something, anything about the forms or the system that people want to ask? It, yes, well, there's an awful lot going on. It is, it, it is tricky. You but, want some yeah, I can add that on. Yeah, yeah. If you want to send it to Joyce, because yeah. she actually collates the data and then sends it on to me, because I, I can just add it on to the 2016 one. All these graphs will be on the Facebook page and on the website as well. So don't worry about having to. Um, remember any of it, I will post it all on there. And as I say, don't think we're drawing any firm conclusions. This is a monitoring exercise. Mm. But as soon as we start to think that doesn't look good, we will then go back to the committee, the veterinary advisor, the genetics advisor, and say, what do you think? And then we, we know we've got a way to go forward then. There we are, right. Thank you very much, that's great Steph. <laughs> interesting things to think about there um, and I think there is I think we raised the point last year about flat chested kittens and about whether perhaps for some newer breeders that the condition of flat chestedness isn't really fully recognized and that the kittens may die when they're quite young and only a few weeks old but the condition may not have been recognized by the breeder at the time so it's probably also about some more education out there and more helping people to understand what the problems can be to, to help the statistics to be better so keep sending all of the information to to joyce yeah, yeah. Jo yeah. Yeah. No, they're not normally flat chested at birth at all. It's quite a bit, that would be a rather an unusual situation. Um, but I think there are breeders who wouldn't recognise the condition even when the kitten is a week or so old, old week to two weeks old when they can first become flat chested. Yeah, yeah. 
So I think there's, as Steph says, it's a matter of keeping on gathering information because it's only then that you really pick up trends in the data because at the moment we've got an awful lot of noise in there and, and that needs to be ironed out so you actually pick up real trends. Great, right. Our third speaker this afternoon is Penny Mordant. Um, I can't call you MP because you're on, on sabbatical for a, for a month whilst uh, Perda is in action. Um, but you are a minister. Thank you very much for sparing the time to um, come to the meeting this afternoon. Um, Penny's going to talk to us about life in Westminster and a very, very heavy moggy theme in the talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kim. Um, well, thank you very much. My presentation will not take half an hour, so get the kettle on. <laughs> um, but I'm very um, happy to be able to come and, and talk to you. And as, as uh, Kim said, it is the appropriately named Perda period. So I'm not going to talk about anything political or whatsoever. Um, and I thought um, that you might like to know a bit about the cats that actually live and supposedly work in Whitehall and across um, our embassies. Uh, as you may have seen, on those of you on Twitter, quite a lot of um, uh, uh, Moggies are now having their own Twitter accounts and are, have enormous numbers of followers. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, some of those uh, cats and why I think this is a, a, growing, uh, a growing trend. Um, there are... I think there are all sorts of reasons why we have cats in government departments, uh, but the cover story is that we have a huge mouse and if in Downing Street rat uh, problem. Um, uh, unfortunately, the uh, the cats, um, with the odd exception, um, are generally very bad at catching uh, mice. Um, so I do think this is a bit of a, a bit of a front. Um, but we do genuinely have severe um, rodent problems um, in in the Whitehall area. I remember going into um, uh, the tea room uh, one evening in the House of Commons, very late when it was a late sitting, and I thought I was going to. Uh, pass out because the floor was moving mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I sort of managed to focus I realised it was mice uh, hundreds of them uh, late at night running across the, uh, the um, uh, uh, corridors and in fact um, David Cameron brought back in uh, cats to Downing Street because he was entertaining um, some very important guests at a, a cabinet uh, dinner and um, a load of mice uh, <laughs> stampeded through the room and he, had, he, was, he was actually throwing forks at them to try and um, protect his guests. Um, so that is the cover story um, about why we, uh, why we have cats. Let me see if I can do this correctly. Is this the right way? Yes, there we go. So, um, and by way of further introduction, these are my little babies. Um, uh, Beetle is my chocolate. Uh, Polaris, uh, who's asleep in the middle, is um, uh, her brother. Um, uh, lilac, um, and then my other two cats are from Beetle's uh, two litters. So I've got Achilles, who's the brown, and uh, Anya, who's going to be my new um, breeding queen, is um, is a lilac torty. Um, and uh, yes, like most cats, they sleep an awful lot. Um, so that's that's mine by way of introduction. Um, but I was just going to talk to you a little about probably the most famous uh, cat of all, which is Larry. So Larry is now ten years old. And um, he uh, was a uh, cat who was resident at Battersea uh, Cats and Dogs uh, home. Um, and he was brought in by David Cameron following that cabinet dinner that I've just described. Mm -hmm. He actually has um, uh, been given a blue plaque by Battersea Cats and Dogs home um, because uh, when he was... Um, uh, adopted by uh, number 10, they had a 15% increase in Moggy adoptions. Um, so he's done a lot of good and raised the profile of uh, why it's a good thing to um, adopt a Moggy. Um, and he ha actually has some official duties. Again, this is all a big front. But um, Downing Street describes Larry's duties as greeting guests to the house, <laughs> inspecting security defences, 
<laughs> testing antique furniture for napping qualities. <laughs> and it also says that Larry is, and I quote, contemplating a solution to the mouse occupancy of the house. And that Downing Street also says that that solution is still years on in the tactical planning stage. Because <laughs> I think Larry has caught two mice uh, since he was appointed. One, one on camera as well, the, the media picked it up. Um, so he arrived there in uh, 2011. And Battersea Cats and Dogs Home um, really said that he was a very good ratter. This is how he's described, but this has not uh, turned out to be the case. And Larry, all Larry's food and vet bills are paid for by the staff of Downing Street. And that's a similar arrangement in other government departments. It's the staffers, the civil servants there, um, and the ministers that will pay for, um, uh, for their upkeep. Um, and uh, Larry's routine, I know Larry very well, we've, we've met on many occasions, and Larry has his own little routine. He, um, Downing Street is a, it, it looks a tiny uh, place, but actually it's got a vast complex behind it, and it has also the private residences in it um, for, um, in particular, the, the Prime Minister and uh, the family. Um, and Larry was actually banned from David Cameron's private residence because uh, of cat hair. Um, the Prime Minister had a really bad problem um, with getting cat hair on uh, uh, his suits. And as we know, all cats, they, they go make a beeline directly for the thing that they're not supposed to get cat hair on. Uh, so Larry was banned from the private residence, but he has the free reign of uh, the, uh, the rest of Downing Street and indeed the very lovely garden as well. Um, and so he has a little routine. He, uh, during the morning, he will visit every department. He will do a little tour of, uh, and obviously everyone makes a fuss of him uh, when he comes in. But then in the afternoon, he'll go and sit outside for a while, uh, outside, uh, and um, uh, the, um, the policeman outside uh, presses the bell for when Larry wants to come in and out. Um, so there's the door open for him. But right by, when you go through the door of Downing Street, um, you have these wonderful uh, um, deep window sills which disguise the, ra the, the radiators, um, beautiful historic uh, pieces. And they have a, a sort of air vent with holes in where the hot air comes through. Mm -hmm. And Larry has his bed uh, during the day on that. He's got his own little uh, monogrammed uh, 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 cat bed. Um, and it's strategically placed, not just for the, the warm air. He can keep an eye on who's coming and going, which dignitaries are coming in, which ministers are coming in. But it's also where you have to leave, if you're coming into Downing Street, your mobile phones, because um, uh, we're all paranoid. Our mobile phones are bugged. So everyone who comes in, if you're talking about government business, has to leave their mobile phone by the door. So everyone has to come past and obviously uh, tickles the cat. So he's, he's a smart cookie, and that's where he stationed himself. Um, so that's his little routine, and um, he's had some rivalries with other cats. Uh, quite a, a lot has been documented, but more on that but, uh, later on. But in particular, a cat called Freya and a cat called uh, Palmerston. Um, so that's Larry, and he's really uh, kingpin. He is the, uh, the chief mouser uh, in Whitehall. And prior to Larry, we had uh, these uh, three cats. So um, over on the far left, that is um, Humphrey, who is very famous. You will have uh, no doubt heard of Humphrey, who was uh, famously the nemesis of um, Sir Bernard Ingham, Mrs Thatcher's press secretary, who hated cats. And of course, cats, they know if, you, if someone doesn't like them, they will make it their mission to go and sit on them, sit on what they're reading, all this sort of stuff. Humphrey, who is uh, named after Sir Humphrey Appleby out of Yes Minister, he started very, very new when he was just um, uh, a year old, and he served under Mrs Thatcher, uh, John Major and um, six months of Tony Blair's um, uh, 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 term in office. Um, and he was again uh, paid for by uh, the staff of Downing Street. So he took, up, he took office in uh, 1988. And um, at that time, um, it was estimated his food and vet bills were about £100 a year. And this was in stark contrast, the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, got the, the bill uh, for the, the actual pest controller of um, Downing Street, um, which was £4,000 a year. So there was this, uh, so he was very good value for money, so said the Public Accounts Committee. Um, but in uh, 1995, he went missing. 
Um, he disappeared uh, for some time and he turned up at the Royal Army Medical College. He'd been adopted by um, a student there and was duly returned um, to Downing Street. And the Downing Street Press Office issued a press release to say that he'd been on holiday. Uh, and he was thanking the staff of the, uh, the Royal <laughs> Army Medical College for his holiday. Um, and, and he was actually a reasonable, uh, a reasonable mouser. He did actually uh, do some uh, work for his uh, upkeep. And there was a bit of controversy um, in that he, uh, when the, the Blairs came in to Downing Street, there was lots of speculation that, that Sherry Blair didn't like cats. And after six months of um, uh, uh, being there with, with Humphrey, Humphrey was retired in 1997. Um, and uh, he actually, it was rather unfair on uh, Mrs. Blair, because he had, he had some kidney trouble, and uh, it was thought best that, they, that he ought to sort of have a, a bit more of a gentle uh, pace and a, a quieter life. So he was retired. But there was obviously massive press speculation that the Blairs had done him in. And the late Alan Clark was particularly uh, vociferous in uh, uh, saying that he needed proof that the cat was still alive. So, I'm not making this up, uh, the press corps, uh, uh, the, the press lobby in Westminster, were taken to, blindfolded to a secret location uh, somewhere in South London and, um, and were, shown, uh, were shown him in his uh, new home, which he was very, very happy. Uh, and so he was retired in 1997, but he lived uh, until 2006. So he, was, uh, he had a, a good, uh, good long uh, innings. Um, and... Uh, uh, prior to uh, Humphrey arriving on the scene, we had Wilberforce. Now, Wilberforce is probably um, the, the most uh, efficient and effective mouser that uh, Downing Street's uh, ever had. So um, he was uh, uh, appointed in uh, uh, 1973. Uh, and uh, he served under Heath, Wilson, Callaghan, and, uh, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher. Um, and there was actually a cat before him as well um, called Petter. Um, but he actually did a very good job uh, and, um, and uh, served until uh, 1986, I think, uh, in post. And then um, after Humphrey came this cat here. Now, this is Sybil named after Sybil Fawlty, and she was um, Alistair Darling's uh, family cat. So when he became uh, Charles of the Exchequer, um, he actually, uh, there are two flats in, uh, there's one in um, number 10, there's one in number 11, and um, they were sort of switched round, uh, the Prime Minister was supposed to be in one, the Chancellor in the other, but they were switched round, I think, because... Uh, um, uh, the, the Blairs needed a, a, a larger apartment. So uh, when Alistair Darling, as Charles Exchequer, moved into the, um, the number 10 flat, um, Sybil came uh, uh, with him uh, in uh, 2007. And uh, she, was, uh, she was already quite um, uh, elderly, and uh, she died uh, in uh, 2009. But that was the, uh, the cat uh, that um, directly preceded uh, Larry. So there was a bit of a gap between 2009 and, and 2011 when uh, 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 Larry was appointed, hence the, the massive rodent pop problem that we, uh, we have now. Um, but uh, although number 10 has been the main focus and has the most famous mogs, um, other government departments decided this was a good idea, and it was in part, I think, driven by the, the mouse population. So let me introduce you to Freya. Now, Freya is quite uh, a character. Um, she's George Osborne's uh, pet cat. And when the family first got her, um, and they were living in Notting Hill before he became uh, Charles of the Exchequer, um, at six months old, she went missing. And uh, she went missing for uh, quite some time. So she was born in, in 2009, went missing at six months, and she was rediscovered in 2012. So she had gone off, and she was living not very far from where the family home was, and uh, uh, had just been living um, as a stray. She is a complete uh, character, and actually latterly had to be removed um, from uh, uh, Whitehall and sent to live in the country um, for reasons I shall go into. But she's, um, she's extremely feisty and she also um, 
uh, gets into a lot of fights, and she had some very well documented fights with Larry, uh, in particular, um, quite often in front of the entire press corps uh, <laughs> outside Downing Street. They were certainly not uh, not shy about it. Um, so she's um, she, but she was a, 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 an incredible character. And as I say, in 2014, she had to be relocated to the country um, because she's fiercely uh, independent. So what are the s- sorts of things that she got up to? Well, first of all, she liked uh, her evening routine uh, to be leaving uh, the Downing Street uh, gates, uh, so she'd pass all the police uh, on the way out, and then she would cross six lanes of traffic across Whitehall um, and go to the Red Lion pub. Now, the, the Red Lion pub is a bit of a fixture in Whitehall. It even has a division bell, the, the bell that sounds when we vote in it. It's a sort of very famous fixture. And she just liked hanging out there in the evening. So that's where she went. Um, uh, she would, everyone would sort of pile out their offices, go to, go to the Red Lion, and she would go in there and sit on the bar. And um, uh, when uh, last orders is gone and they'd, they'd packed up the pub, the landlord of the pub would then carry her back over the six lanes of traffic and deliver her back. And this was her her usual evening routine. Um, She liked to go to the theatre, so she would walk up Whitehall uh, and go into uh, Haymarket and Covent Garden, and she'd quite often go and take in a show. Um, She liked doing that and, and quite often had to be, again, brought back uh, to, to Downing Street uh, but I think the, the final straw people were getting a bit suspicious because Freya would go into other government departments and there was lots of paranoia that George Osborne had fitted her with some kind of <laughs> recording device um, and so you know they would, uh, they'd be in a meeting and suddenly people would notice the cat was there it was like shh we, we, you know, we, haven't got an, we haven't got an underspend this year you know. um, so uh, but the, the, the final straw I think, was that um, there are lots of um, uh, sort of special rooms in the Cabinet Office and the Ministry of Defence and underground as well, where we conduct things like COBRA meetings and we conduct all sorts of other uh, things like that. And one day, the, it was actually the first Sea Lord was conducting a really sneaky-beaky exercise uh, in a sort of exercise uh, scenario, so we were rolling it as real, you know, some massive kind of, you know, uh, Russian invasion or some, you know, some really big uh, defence deal. And Freya had managed to negotiate through God knows how many security layers, you know, pods and all sorts of things, retinal scans, you know, to, to get into this, uh, this room and, um, and had managed to actually get in there. And people thought, right, that is the final straw. Freya <laughs> has to go. So um, she, was, she was packed off uh, and she's, uh, um, last I heard, living very happily uh, in the countryside, uh, not behaving herself as, as usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's Freya. And um, so she was the, the treasury mog uh, to start with. And she was replaced last year with this chap. Um, this is Gladstone. And he started work when he was 18 months old. Again, he's another uh, stray uh, from Battersea. Uh, cats and dogs home and he had quite a a, a rough time before being found by Battersea and he um, he actually had to have some sort of special uh, treatment at um, Battersea because he uh, he had to have a sort of special activity feeder because being I think he must have had some you know been very hungry at some points and uh, he would sort of bolt his food so they had to sort of train him out of that habit uh, but he's uh, he's perfectly fine now and he occupies the treasury um, he doesn't obviously catch any mice, but he's, uh, he's a very good fixture. And his appointment, he was appointed in June last year, but the press statement announcing his arrival had to be delayed because of the EU referendum. So he wasn't announced until, until after that. So that's Gladstone. Uh, and this chap, who's one of my favourites, is Palmerston. And he's the Foreign Office cat. And he has a big rivalry with Larry. Uh, they quite often have standoffs with each other. Um, he was, uh, Palmerston was appointed um, again uh, last year and um, has been uh, pushing the boundaries of his territory. So the Foreign Office is sort of um, next door to um, the Downing Street uh, complex. And Palmerston uh, has been sort of trying to uh, encroach on Larry's uh, territory, which Larry does not like uh, very much. 
And on one occasion, he actually broke into <laughs> number 10. He sneaked in with a visiting party and decided to have a good old poke around uh, number 10 and was ejected uh, by um, the uh, uh, police officers there. So he is, he's a, a real character. And uh, if you look, I mean, he's, he's one of the cats that actually takes a real active interest in the work of his department. So quite often when you see... Uh, conferences and things being broadcast from the amazing state rooms in um, uh, in the Foreign Office. Uh, you'll see the audience uh, all sort of sat there, all these dignitaries, and you'll see you know Boris Johnson or other at the podium. And then in between them, in on that huge sort of big carpet, is this cat sort of <laughs> spread out like this. He's he's always there. He's uh, he's very entertaining, and uh, um, people have a, a real uh, affection for him. So so that's Palmerston. And these two, Evie and Ozzy, are fairly new appointments. Um, they were appointed at Christmas, last Christmas, to the Cabinet Office. And the Cabinet Office um, is sort of linked into the, the number 10 uh, complex. And they were appointed uh, um, because they, the, 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 what the Cabinet Office said was that they, they'd reached their centenary and they felt it was appropriate to have uh, moggies. Um, so uh, Evie and Ozzy are indoor cats, but they have the run of four floors in the uh, Cabinet Office. And so the cat uh, on the, the left there is Evie. Um, she is named after Dame Evelyn Sharp who was the first female permanent secretary. And uh, Ozzy is actually one of her kittens, and he is named after Sir Edward um, Osmotherly, who was the author of the rule book for civil servants when attending uh, select committees. And um, they were uh, stray cats, but um, uh, they're the first cats that have come from somewhere other than Battersea. Um, so they came from the Celia Hammond uh, Trust. Um, so they are installed in the, uh, in the Cabinet Office and are uh, doing a, a very good uh, job indeed. So those are the cats of Whitehall, and other government departments are starting to follow suit. And um, many of our other offices around the country uh, that deal with government issues and also our embassies around the world have uh, their, their own cats and I'll come on to why I think that's uh, why they think that's happened um, but we also have a massive mouse problem in, uh, in Parliament um, and uh, I, I described watching the, the, the floor move, but the, the, the mice are um, not remotely uh, frightened of uh, people. Um, my first Christmas when I became an MP, I um, purchased a load of uh, uh, mince pies for um, other women members of parliament. We were going to have sort of some mince pies and get together uh, um, at the end of our sort of first term. Uh, and I sort of put, the, put all these mince pies in the smoking room, which is a room in Parliament for MPs where no smoking is actually allowed, but it's still called the smoking room. And uh, I remember sitting on one of those great big uh, leather armchairs with a mince pie perched on the arm. And when I looked back, there was a mouse literally sat there eating my mince pie. So they are, they are very sweet. I've got a soft spot for them. But it is a problem. It is an issue. Um, so uh, bringing one's cats to work is positively encouraged by mem members of parliament and their staff who work there. So this is, um, this is my office uh, not so long ago. Um, and uh, this is Anya, one of my cats, um, who is just doing a little sort of deterrent patrol uh, around, uh, around my desk and uh, some researchers there. And it just helps just, you know, them patrolling the area, uh, the, the mouse activity levels uh, uh, drop down. And this office is actually, because uh, I'm a minister, it's underneath the, the, um, the main chamber of parliament, and there are lots of ministers down there. So we get lots of, uh, those who, of us who have cats get lots of people asking us, can you just bring them into our office for a bit? Um, and they'll just do a little patrol uh, and then go to sleep for uh, the rest of the day. Um, but this was, uh, this got out <coughs> that this was going on. And um, the sergeant at arms, who is the uh, authority on uh, what happens in the Palace of Westminster, um, wrote to me and said, you are not allowed to bring your cats into work. Um, I mean, MPs bring their dogs in, you know, they, it's quite normal. Um, but you're not allowed to bring your cats into work. And um, 
afforded no other reason, but one guesses it's um, health and safety. It's fine to have loads of mice run around, but no cats. Um, so, uh, and this got out, this got into the, the press that, uh, you know, moggies had been banned and we were, you know, we're going to be overrun by, uh, by mice and a lot of people in Parliament were very upset about it. And also we thought it was rather unfair because the current chief whip has his pet in his office all the time, which is a quite sizable pink-toed tarantula called Cronus, uh, who is in a tank, uh, in an aquarium, on his desk. I think it's designed to give those going for a cup of coffee with him a sort of menacing chill. Uh, but um, so we, and then the public started asking, well, why, why are you allowed, you know, eight-legged creatures, but not four-legged creatures in Parliament? And I was sent a number of suggestions as to how we could circumvent uh, these rules. This was one of the pictures that I was sent. <laughs> um, but we thought, we thought that might be uh, more uh, trouble uh, than it was worth. Um, but we do, so we do, uh, the cats do occasionally go in, but it's, uh, it's on a much uh, quieter basis. Um, so that's... that's um, uh, you can see that the cats are absolutely integral to the, uh, the sort of the life uh, of, of Parliament, uh, but uh, particularly Whitehall. And, uh, uh, and um, I just wanted to conclude by just sort of questioning uh, why that is. Wherever I've um, gone in the world, and it's been my privilege to travel to all sorts of places, um, uh, particularly when I was um, Minister of State for the Armed Forces, and literally everywhere I've gone where there has been... Um, you know, very stressful things going on, you can usually find a cat uh, bringing comfort. So just a couple of examples. Um, when I went to the Falkland Islands, I went to the listening station we have there run by the RAF, right on the top of Mount Byron, which is a huge, huge mountain. And um, to get to it, you can only get to it by helicopter. There's, you could never sort of climb up there. And the only other creatures that live up there are these massive birds of prey. And there's a listening station there, uh, and there are, there are moggies in the listening station. They could have only got there by helicopter. So uh, cats are there. And in, um, I've been to Afghanistan a number of times, and um, we have, a, as well as our embassy there, we have the, the ambassador's residence there in Kabul, majorly fortified area. And it provides um, a bit of sanctuary. When you go in there, it's very well secured. It's very well protected. And it has a complex of gardens in it. Uh, where people can c go and stay and uh, whether you're you know, um, the, the defence attaché or whether you're a member of parliament visiting you can, you can go and stay there and it offers you uh, you still have to be you know, on your guard and alert but it's, it's a bit of a, an oasis in what is otherwise quite a stressful environment and there are cats everywhere um, and I think that uh, as well as uh, you know, it's a bonus if they do uh, they are able to catch a few mice um, but I think that uh, it is, uh, I, I never cease to be amazed about how the presence of an animal, whether it's a cat or a dog, can change and alleviate uh, stress, how they help people get well, uh, and how they uh, just actually give comfort and calmness and enable people to relax and unwind. I mean, this is why they're, they're such popular pets, but it's always, uh, it's always a delight uh, when I go somewhere and there's the, an oasis of peace and calm for people uh, with, with moggies uh, in it. Uh, and I think that is fundamentally why, um, uh, since we have brought moggies back into government departments, um, the performance of those government departments has uh, increased and general morale and, uh, and uh, well-being uh, and happiness. So I hope whatever the outcome of the election that's going on at the moment, that this will be a trend that continues. Um, and I hope you found that uh, interesting. Uh, and I know what we need of more in Parliament now. They're not going to say so. <laughs> Thank you. It's absolutely wonderful. First of all, um, I've got a few opening remarks, um, but I think I will just start, start by um, giving you some information about members who have passed away, who are members of the club in the past year. Um, they're not people I know personally, but they may be much more familiar to you. So there's Mr Ian Leach. Mrs. Peggy Leach and Mrs. J. L. Davis. Okay, before I go on to um, 
introducing um, the afternoon and, and giving a little bit of background to the reports. Um, apologies for absence. We have um, 30 members who have apologised um, and not able to attend the meeting. Um, I've got two others added. If I pass this round, if you do have any others to add, would you please do so, and then I'll recall, that'll be recorded formally in the minutes. Thank you. OK, so um, a warm welcome. Um, 2016, as many of you will know, has been um, a very busy year for the committee and for the club. And it, we saw many changes, including the resignation of some committee members um, of our assistant welfare officer um, and some other changes along the way. The club remains very strong in terms of membership. And our return to um, the GCCF for last year shows 830 voting members in 2016. So this is still a very healthy number. We're still one of the biggest clubs in the cat fancy. Um, and we're, I think we're holding on well to those members. Um, the figures have seen a, a small decline um, from the previous year. Uh, the number of breeders registered has also declined, and it's declined by 26 people since last year. And that's quite a lot um, in, in not a very big community. So I think we've got breeders who um, maybe, as we're all getting older, um, they're not breeding anymore, and we've not got new people coming into the system. So that's something that would be great to be able to have some influence on and change and bring about um, encouraging the new people in. We don't regularly have tables at our shows, um, but we did have a table at our own show in January this year. Much of our printed literature is rather out of date, and we're now in the process of updating some of that material, and um, Robin Kemp, wherever you are, Robin, has taken on um, part of that job. Um, there's a raft of information now available more generally on the internet, which was never there years ago. Um, if we went back 20 years, we'd have been hard put to find that basic information. And that was actually reiterated by Joyce in her talk. You know, the information wasn't there. You only knew about it by talking to, to fellow breeders. There's a lot more information out there now. There's a lot more veterinary information. So we're going to look very carefully at what um, leaflets and information we can still provide um, as specialists for the Burmese cat. Um, the kitten list is very ably managed um, and manned by um, Steph and the listings regularly updated. It's interesting to note a significant decline um, in the number of kittens appearing on the list and an increasing number of phone calls for people looking for a new companion. So we have not so many kittens and lots of people looking. So that's good that the people are looking, but the kittens are not coming through the system. Whether they're being advertised elsewhere, I don't know. You may have thoughts on that. Um, but we have some development, which I'm going to mention in a minute, which will hopefully encourage more people to put kittens on our list. The stud list has also shown a decline in a number of entries over the years. Um, less people seem to have the time for what is a demanding task and don't want to take on the, response of, the responsibilities that having a stud cat can entail. Um, club merchandise is been very ably managed by Alan Bell. Um, Alan's um, our secretary, Francis' husband, up in Scotland. Um, and this year, Heather has also helped out with sending the calendar orders out. Um, the calendar was designed and produced for this year by Mark Williams Banning. It's been really well received. We've got lots of good reports back about it, uh, both from members and non-members, actually. People see it as a very professional document. Um, we want to thank him for all the work he's put in over the years on producing it. He's done it now for a few years, and um, he has now decided that it's a bit too much for him to continue to do. So for 2018, we are very grateful to Dimitri, who is manning the camera. Um, Dimitri has offered to put our calendar for next year together. So there'll be notices going out asking for photographs to come in for the calendar. The Burmese Cat Club News. 
Uh, well, what can we say? It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It goes from strength to strength. We get comments all the time coming in about how people enjoy reading it, the range of articles. It is a magnificent production which involves a huge amount of work from Georgina anderson Keeble, who's the editor, but also from her very capable assistant, Michelle Codd. Michelle does a lot of the proofreading and um, looks at the English in the articles and things like that. And I think what we have is an absolutely outstanding magazine, and I think one of the best in the cat fancy. Uh, we get, still get a very wide range of material in it, um, uh, fictional articles, factual material, photo spreads, updates on rehomes, stories from cats on boats going places. Uh, Francis does book reviews. So, in fact, I think the material in it is getting wider ranging as the years go by. And it will be nice to see some of um, the old photos that Joyce has got of the, red, the original reds and creams and some of those old documents which can also appear in there. So I think we're going to go ahead with that. And I'm sure Georgina will be delighted with that. The Burmese Benevolent Fund um, continues to serve a growing need for Burmese cats in need of help. Um, Sally, hand up please. <laughs> Tirelessly, and I say tirelessly, sorts out the day-to-day -day issues. Um, Sally went offline for a couple of weeks earlier in the year and asked me if I could take over. Well, I almost broke down in a week. I couldn't cope with talking to all the people and, and trying to help. So Sally does a most fantastic job. Um, we have a growing... Well, we, we, we decided to look at how we might have much more flexible accommodation for the cats that come in temporarily to us and need to be looked after. And we put out a, a call through an all-member email uh, end of the year, beginning of this year, and we got lots and lots of people volunteering various sorts of accommodation, temporary let time when they could look after a cat, foster homes, a whole sort of range of ways of looking after the cats that are in need of short-term care. And we now have um, countrywide coverage right the way from... Orkney, Shetland or somewhere, somewhere up in the... Uh, OK, but we go right to the north of Scotland and we go down to Sussex and a few more in the southwest. So we, we, but it's really worked asking people to participate. So that's worked really well. Um, we regularly receive donations from people who give up cats who are looking for new homes, as well as those people who take on a cat. Both of those groups of people make a contribution to the Benevolent Fund. Um, we also receive legacies, and sometimes those legacies could be many years in coming. I think we've got one at the moment that's been being negotiated for the past three years. So some of these things are very lengthy. Um, the fund has assets at the moment of just over £217,000, which is a substantial amount of money, but it costs a substantial amount of money to look after these cats. And our annual bills are in the region of about 25 to 30,000, that's just for normal activity. So if we were to have any sudden um, need to, to help with a larger rescue situation, um, it would eat substantially into what we have. Um, the money is invested, it's in investment bonds, okay, there's not much interest at the moment, but it's being looked after carefully and in the right place. Um, we now have a new, a very capable treasurer, Anita Hobbs, in brackets, ex-bank manager, very capable, uh, to take us forward. So um, Anita will be looking after the, the purse of the Benevolent Fund. The show this year was held for the very first time as a back-to-back -back event with the Short Head Cat Society, and quite a number of people here were at that show. Um, there were also other breeds present, I think there were about another five or six breed clubs um, also present and the show was held at a venue near Coventry. Um, many of our entries, because of the fact that they could get two certificates, came to get the certificate from the Burmese show and from the Shorthaired Cat Society show because that counts as an all breed for us. That worked really well. Um, the show was very well supported. It had a pretty good atmosphere and for the first time in I don't know how many years but it's at least, I don't know, five, six years or more, um, the show made a small surplus of £500, and that is a real achievement. So sharing the costs has worked out very well. Um, 
with Hall and Penning costs being the major expenditure at any show, the sharing of costs with other shows in the same hall um, is very advantageous to us. Um, we've decided, again, to go back to back with the Short Haired Cat Society in January 2018. I don't know what the date is, I think it's about the second week in Jan third week in January. But after June 2018, we are looking at some new ventures, um, pot potentially joining with some other big um, all-breed clubs. So we'll report back when that happens. We, we, we're just starting some discussions. Um, the reason for the June date, as many of you will know, is that the 1st of June takes us into the new show season. So potentially we have the possibility of having a show in January and a second show later in the year if the club that we were to team up with is having a show at that time. But we've got to go through those negotiations. Um, and last but not least, um, things have moved apace in the past six months at last with um, the new website project. And we are just about to launch um, the new website, which should be up and running literally within the next few weeks. Um, Steph's been working with, the, with Chantelle Watt, who's been coordinating the website. It's very colourful. Mm -hmm. um, it's full of photos. You can put all sorts of things on it. Um, it's very, very modern and bright. Um, and most importantly, it's going to be operated in a way which will allow appointed people who have been trained to do it to put stuff on the website so we haven't got to be reliant on a web uh, master and that that's going to be much more flexible so kittens can go on the list instantly studs can go on there instantly if you've got photos to go on uh, rehome stories about the cats they can go on it, it's going to be a much more interactive and quick thing um, so once it's running we'll send out a notice um, and we hope you like it and um, send your feedback in and anything else you'd like to see on it in due course, it will have the ability to take um, donations for the Benevolent Fund and to operate um, any merchandising. We haven't got that in initially because it's quite a lot of extra expense and it's um, a, an extra thing that can be bolted in and we want to get it up and running. So that's where we are with that. Anybody got any comments, questions? Um, the full reports in which I took these summaries are in the paperwork, which there are copies all around. Okay, the minutes of the 2016 AGM is the first document which appears in your minutes. It's set out as two columns on the page. And it's one, two, three, four pages long. Um, and that's there for information. We don't normally take agreement on the minutes of the, of the previous AGM, so that is there for information. Okay, the election results. Very exciting time has been had. Um, I think these have been circulated. Francis circulated the um, outcome of the election to um, the people involved, um, but the information hasn't generally been circulated. So, um, I'm going to read out the results from the highest vote um, to the, the lower votes and let you know who, who's where. So, Francis Bell, 130 votes. Steve Crow, 102. Peter Collin, 94. Sue Chase, 94. Caroline Kemp, 92. So, those five candidates fill the five vacancies that were in existence on the committee. Olga Walker, 81. Sandra Wardley, 76. Alan Ward, 68. Tracy Whitmore, 44. Valerie Water, 32. So we had a total of 813 votes cast. Do you remember how many? Sorry, Patricia. I'm just calling on um, Patricia Ross, who was the scrutineer for the election, because I haven't brought the piece of paper that said how many responses we got, and I thought that might be useful just to let you know how many uh, ballot sheets came in. That sounds about right for the normal uh, vote. Um, I haven't actually got that yet. 
Okay, so it was just so over 190. Thank you, and that's pretty typical of what we get. So we get about, about 800 and something voting people, members. We get a response of about 200. Yeah. <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> okay. So that's where we stand with the election results at the minute. But the item five, which is the proposed rule changes, um, can have an effect on the election results in terms of any further candidates who will come onto the committee, depending on whether the rules, rule changes which have been proposed by the committee are accepted or declined. So I just wanted to give a two-minute um, summary of the background to the rule changes. So, first of all, is the proposal that the committee have put forward to change Rule 6, and just in case anyone wants it, there are copies of the rules are, are circulating. So the first proposal is to change Rule 6, which is to do with the management of the club, Paragraph 1, and that is to reduce the number of committee members from 15 to 12. Um, the club currently has one of the largest committees in the cat fancy, and in fact one of the largest committees I've ever come across um, professionally. Um, and if I'm, I'm sure I'll stand, might stand corrected, but the 15 was the original number of committee members when the club was set up in the 1950s, so there have been no changes since then. Um, we also have, apart from our committee members, a number of co-opted members doing specific tasks and roles. So, for example, our GCCF delegates don't have to be members of the committee, so we may in fact have another three delegates on top of the 15 um, who are co-opted members. Um, Georgina anderson Keeble, as um, editor of the magazine, is also co-opted. Um, and if we have people to do specific tasks, they may also be co-opted onto the committee. So our committee meetings are huge, huge. Um, this means that not only are there a lot of people there, but they can be very expensive. The club pays travel expenses to all of its um, committee members, regardless of where they come from. And it also means we have to um, book a meeting room, which is large enough for it to accommodate everybody. Um, teleconferencing is something which has been suggested to us, but to be quite honest with you, the thought of doing a teleconference or a Skype meeting with 20 people sends shudders through me, and we have never attempted it. Um, we think if we could reduce the numbers to 12, that it may be possible to um, uh, perhaps consider some sort of teleconferencing. There are various methods which could be used to reduce the size of the committee, and the committee has agreed that the sensible way forward is to use the existing committee vacancies to help achieve the reduction. If the rule change is approved by the AGM, then the reduction in committee size would be with immediate effect. In the event that the rule change is not agreed, then the candidates with the next two highest number of votes will be elected to the committee, bringing the numbers to 15. Does anybody have any comments, questions, or points? I just remember this being discussed a few years ago when I was actually on the committee. I think we started discussion um, at least six That's years six ago, years ago. Yeah. Well, if not more. Yes, we've been yeah. talking about it for some time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about time. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Can I have someone to oh. Lorna? Can, can somebody count, please? Sorry, do you want to make a point? Oh, can we propose? Yes, can I have um, a proposer and um, a seconder, please? Steve, propose. Sue? Yeah. Second. Okay, can I have a vote from you, please, to agree to that rule change? Vote. Patricia, you can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it's unanimous. Yes. Yes. 
It's unanimous. Thank you so much. We needed a two-thirds majority, by the way. <laughs> OK. The second change um, proposed by the committee is also to the same rule, to Rule 6, Paragraph 2, which is to allow in the future for the use of electronic voting. Uh, the club rules were written more than 50 years ago, and although there have been updates and amendments over the years, some rules to some degree reflect the limited forms of communication available when the rules were put into place. The committee recommends that this rule be amended to include the potential for electronic voting. Many organisations and professional bodies now carry out elections in this way, and it's, it's a very widely used process. If the rule change is agreed, it would give much more flexibility on how an election is undertaken and would save many hundreds of pounds in postage costs. We obviously have to look at the right procedure for doing it, um, because we have to make sure that nobody is excluded from the vote, and we would propose letting our um, members know about this change gradually through paper correspondence to start with and then bringing in potentially bringing in electric voting in the future. Can I have a proposer? Oh, sorry, is there any questions? Sorry. It's not a question, Kim, it's just a comment. Um, we've been looking at this, the GCCF, and I've had um, it investigated in terms of, you know, the, the, the um, remote voting and how secure uh, it is. And we discussed it at our last board meeting. Um, and the feedback is that it's very secure, it's very robust, mm -hmm. it's well established. Because we have had a number of, um, not so much clubs, but bats who would like to have the facility oh. for remote voting. Mm. So, so it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a live issue within GCCF. So I think it's worth commenting to say it is being more widely demanded within the cat fantasy. So if we agree this, it would be in line with... Well, it may be that the GCCF then investigates an appropriate... Um, we've already, facility that's we've out already begun to do that, yes. Excellent. Wow, thank you. OK. Um, any other comments? Can we have a proposer and a seconder? Well, we... A seconder? OK. And vote for accepting the rule change. And it's unanimous. Thank you ever so much. Yes, and um, Anita has <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, the latter part of the paperwork um, you have in front of you shows the Honorary Treasurer's report, uh, the, the data. Um, Etc. for um, the past um, financial year, for 2016. And, and I'm delighted to be able to say that um, Patricia Ross, who is the examiner of the accounts, has come along today and will help to answer any queries, questions that you might have. Um, it was quite a difficult task putting the accounts together. Um, Alan left us in very good order in... Uh, the end of September um, and handed over the relevant financial information um, but it was a little bit difficult to resolve some of the figures but we, we think we've done it in the end um, so being able to answer questions you'll have to see what the question you want to know about and whether we can answer it or not because um, some of this was uh, material that Alan had put together so we may or may not have an answer uh, yes, there should be some at the back. There should be some at the back. Um, can I, Patricia, can I ask you just to give the little bit of background about the um, 
cup situation and the um, fund situation, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, well, before we do the long-term fund, I'm not quite sure how it's called. Do you want to... Oh, we're gone. So I'm not quite sure why, in previous years, it was actually shown as an asset, which was inflating your net worth. So I put it in the right place this year. Uh, it was also suggested last year in the Treasurer's notes that this be written off half of it this year, which has been done, and I think we should write off the second half next year which will increase your income, but it's only for one year, and then it'll be done. Uh, equipment, evidently the equipment was being built a long time ago, so that has been written off, which has caused a bit of a loss, but it's transferred by the uh, income from the fund, or the so-called fund. Cups uh, seems to be for the area. The cups haven't been distributed for a number of years. They seem to be buried somewhere. And whether in fact they have got any true work, we're looking at and we will deal with it in 2016 accounts. So, sorry, 2000, in 17 accounts. So, I think that's all. I think, oh, sorry, Patsy. Just one question. The creditors, aren't they these long term creditors? You're the creditors you'll see on the notes. They're not long term. There is a contingency fee. There's a newsletter fee which wasn't paid until January, so at the 31st of December, it was a credit. Uh, sorry, creditor. And then there was a commitment to the Benevolent Fund, isn't it? Yes, the transfer to the Benevolent yeah. Fund from the club. Yeah. I think when I look through the figures, if you take off the... Um, if you're trying to look at what actually happens with cash in the club, if you take off the uh, accountancy measures, i.e. the transfer of the long-term fund on one side and the equipment disposal on the other side, what you actually end up with is this year an income of about £200 more than last year. Uh, uh, sorry, a surplus of £200 more than last year. We, we break even. We make a very small surplus. That's what it comes down to in a cash term. Can I just ask, what is the equipment? Well, it was. It, it isn't anymore. It was... Um, the secretary's computer and a photocopier. Yes, which were purchased some years ago and have been written off and disappeared. Yeah. 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 The long-term fund was, was a, a, a sort of, I won't call it a red herring, but it was, um, it, it certainly doesn't exist anywhere. It started its life, I believe, as the fund that accumulated the money when people took out long-term membership. So when you pay your 10 years membership, it would amount to £140 or £200 or whatever. And a lot of people had long-term memberships in the past, so there was this apparent fund. But we only had, I think, last year or the year before, two people who took out long-term membership. So there was never anything adding to it, and yet it never got any smaller. 
which doesn't make any sense. So. Have you had something like five and a half thousand pounds in there with 40 long-term members? members. 40 life members. So they can't possibly have made up that amount of money. So um, that's where we are with the account. So they have been examined. So the procedure we need to adopt here, that we need to, to carry out here, is the adoption of the accounts, um, formally adoption of the accounts. So can we have a proposer and a seconder, please? Um, Patty, for propose. And seconder, Lorna. Um, and a vote to um, adopt the accounts, formally adopt the accounts. That's carried, thank you. Um, those accounts have been submitted to the GCCF. Um, appointment of the Honorary Independent Examiner for 2017. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to propose, if it's acceptable, <laughs> to Patricia that um, we ask Patricia to act as our independent external examiner again for next year, if she would be um, so obliged, uh, if that's what you would agree to. Yeah. Yeah. Is everybody in agreement? Yes. yes. Thank you. Well. <laughs> We've got a raffle to draw. Okay, do we have any other business? No? Right, I will formally close the meeting. Oh, sorry, Sue. Oh, um, because I'm going to the BBC, um, I'm supporting the last meeting. Uh, there's been, at some of the meetings, not all of them, but there's, there's been questions raised over numbers. Oh, yes, yes, um, yes, yes. You know, I remember, I can't remember which one which one it was. Um, it's, it's the number of delegates. Not everybody can get um, five people mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I know when I was on the committee, we did discuss it, and we did um, agree that it keeps it fast. But I just wondered whether well, was there any, has anyone actually ever sort of started thinking about these numbers again? Because five is a lot. Uh, yes, it is. But people. now we have three. Clubs. We've got three clubs. They yeah. all have five representatives. Mm. That's a lot of representatives. And there's no reason that, that shouldn't, there shouldn't be a proposal put forward to reduce that. Because mm. it would be all clubs would be reduced proportionally, wouldn't it? Mm. Mm. Uh, who does that come from normally, Steve? Is it well, from the club? It's, no, it's at BAC. I mean, mm. the club can, uh, can um, ask its representatives <laughs> at BAC to uh, propose that. Um, and then there will need to be a vote within the BAC. Now, I believe this happened in the past, yeah. and uh, the society refused. The yeah. society oh, right. voted against. So our three clubs, the Bones Cat Club, Bones Cat Society, and the yeah. Bones Cat. Yeah. 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 The society refused and wanted to stay at five. So the problem then is that if everybody doesn't feel the same, yeah. then people are not equally represented on the BAC. So there needs to be agreement within the BAC to reduce to four, even three, mm -hmm. to, but certainly four, mm -hmm. uh, would be much more sensible for a lot of reasons. Well, there's a lot, the other club was actually um, the BC, I don't know, BCA, yeah, yeah, BCA, it was then that actually asked. Yes. Well, there's no reason we shouldn't vote it again it and ask the BAC to discuss it. Yeah, it was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was last year. I mean, you can hope it's many times as you like, really. Yeah. 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 I just want to go with this, but I haven't even talked to them. I think we'll deal with the flow, don't we? Yeah. Again, it's a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's four clubs, can't yeah. get the delegates. So, yeah. we have a choice to go so, so I think it would be pretty sensible to propose yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We, the, we can ask them to do that. We're quite happy to shorten it. Okay. Well, we'll ask the committee to send a note through to the BAC mm. requesting that that goes on the agenda. Yeah. 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 We we need. I think us on the. Yeah, I see you need to have a word with the committee. Okay, yeah, no, brilliant. No, that'd be really good. Yeah.
Okay, any other IOB? If not, I'll close the formal meeting and I think we might see what we've won on the raffle. Are you going to... Have you drawn that, Caroline? Oh, hang on, Robin. Just tell us before you draw the raffle. Hang on. Yes, yeah, no, they they were um they're all collect they were all collected up some years ago and were being looked after by one of the members, yeah. um Jenny Kennard, yeah, up in yeah. in Cambridge. And I believe they were all sorted into the rubbishy ones, the ones yeah. that had some value. But we have no information are about still, what happened. Are we still using No, them? no, 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 no. The decision was made a long time ago to not so award what them what's anymore. With, with them? What happened to them? Well the minutes from the previous meetings uh, committee meetings recalled that they were going, Jenny was going to sell them, the valuable ones off, and then the money. But uh, I can't find any record of it at all. So we don't. We don't. We don't. Could the valuable ones be put into auction or something like that? Well, that, that was what was supposed to happen. So it's something we need to chase up because it only came to light when we started looking at the figures. I mean, really, I was asking what, because I'm just the last meeting, whether or not you were still going to actually. Have the cups and no. The show. No. Nobody wants to watch. No, no. The, it was decided to get rid of them, but we haven't progressed. What's happened to them? So that's something we need to do to satisfy the next accounts. The members might ask. Yeah, yeah. Robin, can you tell us how much money we've made from the raffle? The and then. Raffle, yes. Thanks to everybody's generosity in giving gifts, donations, and providing friendly opinions. The net proceeds of the raffle is £130. Hey. Well Can I just add something? As well as thanking everyone here for bringing prizes, there's been a £25 John Lewis gift voucher donated by two people who couldn't come here. That is. Um, Alistair and Julie Brown. I don't know them, but oh, it was a very generous offer. Oh, that was very nice. Right. Winning first ticket is white one two five three. Take another time, if you want to. Yeah. 
one, looking for the first time. Oh.